So now we're beginning episode 12, and I want to set the stage. The theme of episode 12 overall is love on trial. Just as the theme of episode 11 had been arbitrary love. That's what's being tested. We ended episode 11 seeing that it's a choice still between God's definitions which God sovereignly sets and any other definition that you want to come up with which will be part of Satan's definitions because all the definitions the human race wants to come up with are essentially based on self-merit and good deeds that the self can do. And the big problem with that is, first of all, it ends up being a self-focus, so it ends up being based on hatred, because if you have to focus on yourself, you have to eventually put down everything else. And the other problem with it is that you end up like being on this hamster's treadmill where you're constantly feeding your have to feed your ego about what good deeds you do how good you are and and eventually therefore you have to shut out everybody else so you're all on top of the mountain all by yourself and that leads to a great deal of frustration and loneliness so it's like what's the good of being good if that's the result um, the other problem, of course, and the bigger problem in many ways, is that you're living apart from God. I mean, it's bad enough that you're living by yourself and to yourself, and you're all you're you know alone on the mountain, and you have to shut everybody else down or out in order to be the best, in order to say you're worthy, which is exactly how the human race goes. Okay, everything becomes a threat to self-worth in Satan's plan which is of course you know we see that daily play in the world but the bigger worst the, the worst part about it is is that you don't even get to be with God because if you have to be number one then there's no room for anybody else to be up there on the mountain with you and there's certainly no room for anybody to be above you namely God and even worse than that <clears throat> is that you have to you know, you're having absolutely no relationship with God. See, if you're number one, you can't bear to have anybody above you. So now you can't have a relationship with God because he really is above you. That's why it's so, such a stark contrast when we go through the love on trial thing. Is that God's plan is love. It's all the opposite of what I just described. And... It seems to be a problem because he's so high and we're so low. But since love is the connection and love is the integrity of God, it erases that differential between high and low. Because that's what he wants to do. He enjoys doing it. So it's not like he's doing it to sacrifice himself. Even though he is sacrificing himself. He sovereignly chooses that that's how he wants to use his godness. It pleases him. So he's not doing it to be number one on the mountain. He's already number one on the mountain. He doesn't like being alone. Like he said in Genesis 1, not good that man should be alone. Genesis 2. Not good that God should be alone. There's not just one person who's God. And that would be hell itself if God were all by himself. There's only one person who's got who's Godness. Nobody to share it with. That's the true definition of hell. And that's the, the very kind of life that Satan wants. To be number one on the mountain, beating God. He thinks he'll be happy if he does that. That's why it doesn't matter if Satan won. Because God will be happy in any situation. His happiness is self-contained. His happiness is, is, is inside himself. It doesn't matter if he wins or loses. So everything he does is based on love. So even though he's king of the mountain, he treats himself like a slave for us. And he loves doing that. Satan can't understand that, and frankly, neither can I. 
I don't think the human race understands it either. Because everybody else except God has a priced love. We call it love when something pleases us that we get. True love is, is not that. True love is when you give your all to the object. And, and you don't call it a sacrifice. You don't even think about it as a sacrifice. The closest thing to true love in the human race is a soldier giving his life for his country. Really doing it, not doing, not like being forced. And there are a lot of soldiers who have done that, you know, in time. A lot of them. The next closest thing would be parents giving their lives for their children. Genuinely doing it, not because it's expected or it's a societal norm. Same thing as a soldier. There are soldiers and parents who do things because of society. That's not true love. You could call it honor, maybe. But it's not true love. True love is where you just, I mean, and, and we all have little bits of it every day, where you give everything you've got to something because you wanted to, just because you wanted to. And whatever excuses you give yourself, they're excuses you give yourself in order to justify what you want to do anyway. Okay? I want to eat peanut butter. I love peanut butter. I'll give money to it I'll, I, if I could eat it all day long. And that was the only food on the planet and that was all I could eat. And it didn't make me fat. I would eat it all day long, constantly. I love it. And even if it did make me fat, I'd still want to eat it all day long. But of course, I can't do that, but I'd like to. So you see, I'd like to sacrifice myself to peanut butter. But, you know, I'll die. So it's only with extreme reluctance that I don't do that. You see the point? There's a big difference between love and hate. There's a big difference between doing something because you really want to versus um, being, as it were, controlled by the good deeds mindset, which is basically society's expectations, your sense of right and wrong, all that. Those things are not love. Okay, and this is what was upsetting theology for so long, is that if we say that God is love, um, what about righteousness and justice? Well, that's resolved because the Lord loves righteousness and justice, you see. That's Psalm 89. If God didn't love righteousness and justice, then you could well argue that love is, is not appropriate as the head attribute of God. Okay, but if love is absolute, then love loves everything. And if love loves everything, then love loves having everything. And the only way you're going to have everything is to love righteousness and justice first. And that's essentially what's on trial. Is what God created, is what God ordained, is God's plan, is God's idea of stuff, are his definitions truly good, truly righteous, truly just? Satan says no. Satan thinks that his good deeds plan is superior as far as benefiting the human race, as far as benefiting the angels, everybody else. So that's what's on trial, really. God himself, his own design, his own choices, his own ideas. And that's exactly what Hebrews 11 1 says because it's, you know, it's about confidence in word, Christ thinking on trial, evidence unseen. And corrected translation from the Greek using the same meter as the writer of Hebrews actually used in the Greek. That's a whole trial right there. So each one of us is on trial. Hebrews 11, 1, for how much we believe in, a.k.a. vote for, God's plan, God's doctrine, learning God. And sadly, the bulk of the human race, and especially the Christian, votes against God. Less than 1% of Christians are actually functioning in God's plan. 
and I've said that a number of times, and I'm sure a lot of people dispute that the number is that high, but Paul depicts it as a marathon race, Greek verb is treko, and it's a real, you get to the finish line by the end of your life. Okay, but it's, are you even in the race? See, if you're a Christian, you're not using 1 John 1, 9 like breathing. You're not in the race. So so you, you quit either long ago or you never even got to the starting line. You have to be using 1 John 1, 9. You have to be under somebody you know God appointed as your right pastor. You have to be learning and living Bible under that pastor. You have to be talking to God about the Bible you're learning and living under that pastor. And only occasionally... And, you know, like, after checking it with God, do you talk to other Christians? Well, most Christians, I mean, overwhelmingly most. 99% of Christians are not doing that. They're doing something else. First of all, they're carnal. So the whole, they're not even in the race. Second, they're, they're picking for their teacher if any at all, usually supermarket, cafeteria Christianity, if they do that at all, it's usually the nod to God crowd. They walk in on Sunday, it's their laundry chore for the week. They sit down, they stand up, they sit down in a pew for about an hour, and then now they can go do what they really want to do. And they count themselves holy because a lot of other human beings saw them in their nice clothes, and they smiled, and they were polite, and that must be Christian, because that's what they want it to be. They want it to be shallow like that. They want it to be, you know, visible, eyes on people, eyes on things like that. They want to have little epithets of the Bible read to them, and then consider themselves holy because they, they, they actually recognized a verse or two. They want to debate with the shallow things like whether God is one or three, which they never really understand. And they want to be able to say that the guy in the other denomination is bad without understanding that what's wrong in their own denomination. They want to argue denominations like football teams. They want to defend the faith, my faith, my faith, my faith, my faith. Well, obviously... The real God is not their God. Their God is their own pride and their own faith. That's how Christianity is. So what's the love on trial for the bulk of Christians? They die as clueless as they were born. They really won't know God until they die. That wasn't God's plan for their life. Too many stories in the Bible about people who knew God very well from a very young age. But they just like to mouth those stories. They don't want to live those lives. So they don't. And they're busy with their good deeds and their rituals and their works and their this and their that and the other thing. And some of them even became scholars got the degrees after their name and every time they walk into you know church there's a whole bunch of heads that bow and oh that person's you know got to be a spiritual giant and a lot of them are really really hard working that's what's so sad they're hard working they're nice they actually mean what they say and they don't know a thing they spend all their lives doing all the right morality stuff, just like the Pharisees in the Old Testament and in the Gospels. You know, those Pharisees were very hardworking. They were very amiable. They were very nice. And very lost. See, because they start out with their own definitions. Their own definitions of everything from the get-go was solidly Satan's definitions. And they came to love those definitions. They gave their all to it. 
And the idea of anything contradicting their own definitions was anathema to them and they felt that, oh, my faith is threatened if I consider any alternative. So they have closed minds. They make up their own ideas of God and their own ideas of right and wrong. And it's, it's totally shallow. So what's their love on trial? That they had none. Or that their love was for people and things and ritual and alternative definitions, but not for knowing God. So they flunked the first commandment. They're all about the body and behavior and morality and save the world and soul winning and everything but learning God. Everything about the visible and nothing about the invisible. But Hebrews 11 is about the invisible. Invisible words going on in your head. Invisible how you're thinking towards, towards God and how well you're learning God. Just because. The visible life, well, what does the writer of Hebrews talk about? They didn't have a very good visible life. They weren't regarded as important or spiritual by the people around them. In fact, they ended up being ostracized. 99% of Christianity is all into the so-called Christian fellowship being together. If I'm sitting in church with another Christian, that means I'm spiritual. Not according to Hebrews 11. Or anywhere else in the Bible. If I speak Hebrew words, I'm more spiritual. You know, that stupid Hebrew roots movement, the sacred name movement. Just kick all those people out. They'll never know God. Or if you swing incense, oh, you're more spiritual. Yeah, right. I'm not saying those things couldn't be done with spiritual value to them, but you're going to have to be doing the stuff in God's system. Anything you do in God's system is spiritual. Even if you're going to the bathroom. See my God's system video if you don't know what I'm talking about by now. So their testimony is one great big fat flunk. No, we didn't even start the race. Or yeah, we started out for a little while and then long before the finish line, we quit. And that's where I get into my arguments with God because what that means is these people are going to arrive in heaven. Yeah, save forever, knowing absolutely nothing. And they were each one slated to be a king. God foreknowing, of course, how it would turn out anyway. That's why he made, in part, why he made this the plan. We could have all technically, you know, matured in Christ. And we could have all technically been kings with the wealth of a king. But we wouldn't have to have the burden of the rulership that a king has. In other words, a king, a guy is born a king. That doesn't mean that he has to rule, but he'd still be a king. And so each one of us could have been kings. But God knew that that wasn't going to happen. And we wouldn't choose it. So only a few will choose it. And my pastor spent the last, I want to say, 10 years of his ministry trying to figure out how many kings there were going to be. <clears throat> he started it in 1997. Started trying to figure that out. So 1997 to 2003 when he quit. That was what he was trying to figure out. And um, he was playing with the idea of the ratio, like, you know, Moses to the people in the Exodus, which was one to six million and I played with that a bit, but it looks like the ratio is a lot uh, greater. It'd be like 1 to 60 million. Or maybe 1 to 100 million. I mean, it kind of depends on 
how God configures the kingdoms. They're not gonna, it's not like one size fits all, so that everybody's of an equal size kingdom. There's nothing about God's personality or the way he designs things that works like that. So it's all variegated somehow. And in LVS4B.htm, I tried to figure out at least different ideas of calculating the numbers, just to get a sense of it. And my sense of it, and this could be way off, is that population for heaven is, well, likely, that I can say, is likely to be around 100 billion humans. Because most of most of the people that are going to be in heaven are going to be people who died before they were able to reject the gospel. A very high infant mortality pertains to most of human history. So you've got a whole bunch of babies, truly babies, when they died. Okay? And then you've got, um, you know, a whole bunch of humans who didn't necessarily die bef you, you know before they could refuse the gospel but actually accepted it but then never did anything with it and that's going to be 90% of the remainder so the point is is that very very few kings over millions upon millions of clueless believers probably a minority amongst that 99% will be people who actually went somewhere in the spiritual life. I mean, a really small minority. And then rejected it. A lot of your so-called atheists will be in that category. Um, and pretty much everybody else who's a Christian and left Except for I don't know I, I I'm I'm thinking that no more than like a thousand kings for all the the church and that's saying a lot I mean even a thousand is a high number because we're talking about a perfect eternal state we're not talking about a need for a police force we're not talking about you know a large bureaucracy. You know, all the things that the humans down here need because we keep screwing up so much. Well, all that we won't really need. And a lot of the offices, whatever they are, will be kind of honorary. You know, memorializing, you know, the way life was down here. So, you know, the overwhelming majority of Christians are going to get to heaven as babies. All of us will be like you're smarter and cuter and everything else than we are now. But, and we won't have any sin, desire to sin. We'll know too much to want to sin. Um, and it will still be free will. But we'll, we'll be so clear on the, the unattractiveness of sin that like God, we won't want to do it anymore. God's got free will. He can sin anytime he wants. He doesn't ever want to. So whatever it is that he knows that, you know, that's his constant conclusion, we'll have the same constant conclusion, although even even though we won't know as much as he does. We'll know enough for whatever our sizes are. But that's the rub. Whatever our sizes are. You can be a perfect chihuahua or a perfect great dane big difference in size and in this case the size is qualitative if you're king sized in your soul you're ruling a kingdom that means you get to see Christ more often that's the only reason I want this and that's the only reason now I'm constantly arguing with God about this thing. Um, so you you got vast hordes of believers who are children in their souls. And they're perfect in heaven. But they're very childlike. 
in terms of what they understand and how they understand it, how they can process information. I mean, look at how children are. Thing, you know, children learn, how do you want to call it? They learn to parrot very quickly, but they learn to understand very slowly. They don't have much of an attention span. Things easily distract them. They're easily frightened. There will be no fear in the eternal state. But the, the, there will be limits on how much information and contact and understanding you have. Because the only time to get the capital base for that understanding is down here. So the love on trial for the bulk of Christians is going to be flunk. We don't love God. We don't want God. We want something else instead. We voted for Satan's plan. And therefore we die clueless. For the few, very few, less than a thousand, maybe 500, 400, depends on how God configures the kingdoms. Maybe he has a lot of kings with smaller kingdoms. In which case it might be more than a thousand, might be two thousand, three thousand, five thousand. But if I go by history, and by what, how Paul recounts the likelihood of the rapture uh, in his meter of Ephesians 1, 3 through 14, where it dwindles, the likelihood of the rapture dwindles with, with each succeeding 7 to 21 years, the way he did his meter. Um, and then he, it's, there's almost no chance of a rapture happening from Constantine forward. There's no meter at all. In the last, in the winter of church, which is Ephesians uh, 1, 13 through 14. That's the winter of church. There's, there's, no, there's no division. It's only the 91 syllables. Last quarter, last, that's why I call it winter. There, there's no subdivision. So the rapture can happen at any time, but it's not because there's any mass of Christians who are actually growing. It's because of one person here, one person there, one person in another place. That's why it closed with Pro El Picotas in Ephesians 1.12. So in other words, after Constantine, don't even look for a rapture anymore. It's anyone's guess. Because there ain't going to be very much, there, very much of anybody maturing at all. That's scary. And it's been that way ever since. It's now year 2013. And look how dumb Christianity has been. Look how retarded and shallow is its theology. We can't even get the Lord's birthday right. So, that being the case, what sort of persons must we become in a dedicated to God lifestyle? Second Peter three eleven. He just threw that into my head, and that's what's on trial. How dedicated to God is your lifestyle? That's why I kept stressing: you learn and live on Bible in everything you do. Just learn to associate Bible thought with everything you do. You are you tying your shoes? What? How can you use Bible while you tie your shoes? What kind of Bible can you think about? Maybe ask God a question. What kind of activity in the Bible and tying your shoes, what do they have in common? There's going to be something. And I'm always surprised at the answers I get when I ask that question. God is tying high to low on purpose. If God inserts himself into everything, then everything is good. That's how I closed episode 11. God just flat wants to insert himself into everything. It's a good thing he loves doing it because that's the only way anything's going to be good. Satan's trying to say that things should be good on their own without God inserting himself into it. And, you know, the human race plays out what that plan is like. We know that plan in spades. But what about God's plan? When God inserts himself into everything and you're actually thinking Bible while you tie your shoes or do the dishes, or write an email, or stand in line waiting for the bus. 
what is that actually doing? And that's what we're going to be covering in episode 12. We're going to cover a lot of the same ground we went through in episode 11. But now we're going to revisit it from the, the focus of how is love on trial? What does it look like to God, to the angels? How do you live it on a daily basis? I've covered some of that already to sort of lead into this. But now we're going to focus on why is this God inserting himself in your life so much better than if he had endowed everything with its own intrinsic value apart from him. And we'll gradually get through those issues. It's going to be very long, episode 12. We'll gradually get through those issues as episode 12 unfolds. It's going to take a long time. Peace out.